Hi students, welcome to video 22 on water resources. So after the video, you should be able to identify where we get our water and what we use it for, and to be able to discuss consequences of human overuse of water. So here's a picture of Earth. Um, if you took all of the water and put it into one bubble, this is the size that it would be compared to the United States. Um, so that's all fresh water and salt water. Um, all fresh water is in this little bubble right here. Um, and then all of the water that we are able to actually use and drink is going to be this itty bitty dot right there. Um, so you could almost fit that one into the state of North Carolina. You definitely can fit that one there. So we're talking about a very, very small portion that's actually usable for human consumption. Um, so this is a picture of Earth about 6 billion kilometers away when we sent the Voyager space probe out into space back in 1990. Uh, 1990. Um, it actually went out, it had a camera on it, and it was able to turn around and take a picture of our blue planet. Um, so again, this is a really important concept here that the Earth has so much water on it that it even looks blue from space. So looking at where our water is located, we know that there's 3% fresh water on the planet and 97% salt. Of the 3% fresh water, now in class we said 2.5, I know, you'll see it kind of multiple time, uh, differences there. Um, but of this fresh water, you have about 70% in ice caps and glaciers and only about, you know, 31% left that we actually are able to use. And that's like groundwater um, and surface water areas. Um, also soil mo moisture and that sort of thing. Um, now of the 0.3% that's surface water, that's where your lakes, your rivers, your streams are all located. So these are not going to be sources where we can actually get that much water from. Here's a map showing where water is distributed. It is unequal all across the globe. The places that are darker have more water. The places that are lighter blue have less. So you'll notice that desert regions like in the um, Sahara Desert, not a whole lot there. You also have the same sort of situation around different parts of the United States even. Um, so again, some people are having issues with this. Other people are not. Um, so water shortages are going to grow and become a problem if even to some people who it's not a problem right now um, because of things like droughts. We are having more droughts and they're lasting longer. Um, we also know that the population is increasing. It's going to eventually get to that 11 million people by the end of this century. So that's going to put a strain on our water resources as well. Um, and we already have 30 countries in the Middle East and Africa that are already having humongous problems um, with not just feeding their people, but also just getting them fresh drinking water. Um, hydrological poverty is a term we use for anybody that's living in an area where they either don't have access to water or they don't have access to clean water. Um, so both of those things could be the case and that's over 1 billion people on the planet. So vocabulary that we need to know, um, here is your water table. I would encourage you to draw these. Um, the water table is the line that separates the zone of saturation and the zone of aeration. The zone of saturation is where water is saturated in the soil. And I could put a well down and I could actually drill water and get water up. Um, zone of aeration, all, you know, there's basically air all in there. Um, this is a cone of depression where I'm drawing water out of the ground. You'll notice that the cone of depression sinks way below the water table. So just because I can get down to the water table, once I've, you know, taken up a certain amount of water, it doesn't matter. Um, I'm still going to, the water table is still going to be uh, lower for my well. A recharge area is an area where when it rains, it's going to run off down into a stream or a river and recharge that river. Um, the discharge area is the actual place where the river is basically running and it's moving from one location to the next. Um, so you'll notice that if you end up taking water out over here from the discharge area, um, you can eventually run out of water in the stream. So um, most of our aquifers are what we use for drinking water. Um, about half of the wa world's drinking water comes from these under underground aquifers. Um, unfortunately, the water tables are drop are sinking, um, becoming deeper because we are using water for irrigation. Um, again, this is the number one water use uh, that we uh, use or that we do with water. Um, this is the Ogallala Aquifer out in the uh, western United States and we are using it mainly for irrigation and so that's why parts of it are basically drying up now.
Um, the reason we use this aquifer for irrigation is because uh, the United States produces a lot of grain, um, wheat, corn, those kinds of things that are going to really consume a lot of water. Um, India and China also do the same. Um, rice is a very common um, crop that is grown and requires a lot of water. So in the United States, um, we have some issues with droughts. Um, usually it's going to be located in the western part of the co uh, country. Um, this over here, you'll hear about California droughts a lot. And part of the reason why you hear about California droughts is because a lot of their water actually comes from snow melt um, in northern states and into Canada. Um, so the snow can melt and that's how they get their water. So if there's periods of, you know, um, warming where there's um, not enough snow accumulating, then they would not get that. Um, in North Carolina, we generally speaking have a lot of rain, so we're not too you know worried about our drought conditions. But most of the food that the United States uses comes from that western part of the region, so that's going to be an issue um, if they're not able to grow crops. So this we talked about in class. Just please make sure that you know that irrigation is the number one use for water. We use about 70 percent. Um, public water supplies would be like what you are using in your home, for cooking and cleaning and bathing, drinking, that sort of thing. Um, so the other place things, not, not that they're not important, but mainly know that the majority of our water use is irrigation and in the home. Um, here's a picture of basic, basically what it looks like when you start to farm the desert and you use aquifers to do it. So this is what Saudi Arabia normally would look like. No croplands basically here. You're in the middle of a desert. However, if you use the underground aquifers, you can actually grow food in a region that really is usually unfarmable. Um, so that's good in a way, but then we're using these aquifers and depleting them. Eventually, you're going to run out of water and you can't do this anymore. So part of the problem is we're just so inefficient with the irrigation methods that we do use. We use flood, which is pictured down here, and we use furrow a lot of times um, instead of using drip or sprinkler systems. Um, and over half of the water is lost from evaporation when you're using these two methods, uh, which causes you to have to use a ton of water um, even though you're not being very efficient. So one thing that can happen if you're doing this is you can actually cause the land to start sinking down. Um, so subsidence is when you pump water out and basically the land uh, starts to go down because there's nothing to hold it up anymore. There's just air down there. Um, so this is a very famous picture. 1925, this was the elevation of the land. And then slowly over time, we've gone on 50 years and now our elevation has changed uh, considerably because we are irrigating for croplands. Other negative effects of groundwater depletion, well, your well can dry up. Um, you can also have water in streams and lakes drying up, so they produce the water in those. Um, it costs more money if you have to pump um, from deeper down, so that can be a cost issue. Um, and your land use is going to decrease because you're pumping the water out of the ground where the crops or the land was using that before. So it becomes more desert-like. And then in North Carolina, we have saltwater intrusion issues. Um, if you live along the coast and you have a well, you're pumping fresh water out. Well, eventually you're going to pump so much fresh water that salt water can come in and contaminate your well, which then contaminates your drinking water. Um, and we know that rising sea levels are happening because of climate change, um, and that will increase the amount of salt water intrusion that we're, in, we're dealing with if the level of the ocean increases. So how can we conserve water in some of these different areas? Um, in agriculture, we can use things like drip irrigation. We can mulch because we know that mulch actually soaks up water and holds it well for our plants. Or you can use GMOs to create drought-resistant crops. Um, domestically, you can plant native plants that don't use as much water. You can have a gray water system, which is like a catch system for rainwater, or it actually has gray water um, directed into it from your house. So for example, when you take a bath and you let that water out, it's gray water, it's not completely dirty, and you can use that to water your lawn. Um, you can also fix leaks when you have them in your home, um, you know, leaky faucets or, you know, a toilet that continues to run, make sure that's not happening. Um, in industry, you can have cooling towers that basically sit water off to the side and allow it to cool off, and then you can reuse that water and recycle it back into your system. Here's an example. Um, zero scaping is using native plants. 
um, instead of having like a turf grass, you know, like grass um, lawn, that's actually not usually a natural situation to have, you know, grass. Um, so having a native plant yard, you know, looks nicer also um, if you do it correctly or, you know, keep it up. Um, but these are all going to be plants that are native to the area and are tolerant of whatever conditions it has. So what about bottled water? Maybe we're running out of water. Let's use bottled water. Um, the United States actually has the safest tap water in the world. Um, and bottled water is, you know, roughly 200 to almost a thousand times more expensive than tap water. Um, so there's really no reason why we should not be using our tap water. Um, and if you're still not, you know, okay with the tap water, then get a filter to put on the tap water and you're extra careful. Um, also a fourth of the bottled water that you will purchase is actually just coming from the tap anyway. So why are you paying more for something you already have? Um, and tap water does not, or sorry, bottled water does not have to meet the Safe Drinking Water Act policies um, that the actual tap water does have to meet. So those are all reasons why you should not be using bottled water. What about diverting water? Um, we can actually take water from one place and put it into another. Um, unfortunately, we've done that so much from the Colorado River. You can see all the different water diversion areas. These are dams and things like that that we've done. Um, on some days, water does not even trickle into the Gulf of California at all. Um, so that's kind of an issue if you're basically stopping the stream from flowing. Um, we know that dams alter our river ecology, so it's kind of some things to think about there. Um, and in the future, there are people who are projecting uh, potentially wars could break out because of water issues. Uh, we know that shortages are going to lead to conflict, and there's about 260 rivers that are being uh, shared by different nations. Um, so that's kind of a big issue when you're sharing a resource. Um, and a lot of this contributes to hostilities that are happening in countries like uh, Middle Eastern countries. Um, not only are they fighting you know, over land issues or whatever, they're also fighting about water rights. Um, so cooperation here is going to really be the key. Um, just when we're talking about any tragedy of the common situation, cooperation is going to be the key to ensuring that people have that fresh water. All right, bring your questions to class.